this time I'd like to say happy Sabbath, pray and go home. I don't want to follow that. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing your gifts with us. That was a blessing, amen? All right. <laughs> I'm going to need it. <laughs> thank you, that was great. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I believe that that song resonates in the hearts of every parent. And what our kids go through, Father, in this world today around us, it's tough on them. But we claim the promise in Malachi that you will turn the, the hearts of our children back to us and that you will turn our hearts back to you, Lord. We ask now as we go through this message that uh, it would touch us. It would, grab, it would grab us, Lord. And that you are, your presence would fill this room you would block out any distractions from the devil or the demons that may, may like to harass us, Father. And may you um, just have full access to our hearts and minds this morning. Bless me as I speak. We pray that I'll just be a tool and this will be your message. Uh, forgive me where I've fallen short, but Lord, I'm willing to be used. And I pray that you use me now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. This is modern history. Oh, sorry. What am I doing? I'm, I'm starting to get used to it. <laughs> they've, they've, they've beat me down. <laughs> this is modern history, but this happened in America. And the reason why this history is so significant is because this particular event that took place on September 24th 2015 had never taken place in the history of our country. And I understand that our country has a relatively new history, but in the little over 200 years of our country's existence, this never happened. On top of it never happening, what was said may be more important than the event itself. September 24th, 2015... Pope Francis addresses the House of Representatives in the Chamber of Congress, making this the first time a pope ever addressed our lawmakers in the Chamber of Congress. He spoke about many political issues facing our world today. He addressed immigration, climate change, poverty, and even asked for the protection of the ethnic, the protection of ethnic and religious minorities. Now, this all seems innocent, but was it? I mean, after all, climate change may be an issue that we want to address. Certainly, we have to take note of our world poverty and the ever-growing wage gap between the rich and the poor. And I mean, do w I mean, we do want protection for ethnic and religious minorities. These are all good things. However, did the Pope overextend his platform is the question I want to ask. Did the seemingly humble man say and do something that every U.S. citizen should pay attention to? Because you got to remember, as we watch the events of Revelation 13 unfold, the first beast is not the relevant player on the scene. It's the second beast. Of course, the second beast is guided by the first beast. This is a quote from this transcript of that speech. You can Google this speech, and you can get this quote from there. As he walked in the chamber of commerce, uh, Congress, and he looked looked back in the rows of, of representatives, there's a statue of Moses above the door as you look back there. And he fixed his eyes, he gazed on that statue of Moses in the back, and as he gazed on that statue of Moses, he said this, yours, speaking to the congressmen, our lawmakers, yours is a work which makes me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. On the one hand, the patriarch and lawgiver of the people of Israel symbolizes the need of people to keep alive their sense of unity by means of just legislation. On the other, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God and this, the transcendent dignity of the human being. Moses provides us with a good synthesis of your work. Of whose work? Congress's work, lawmakers' work. You are asked 
to protect by means of the law the image and likeness fashioned by God in every human face. Did you catch that? You are fashioned, I'm sorry, you are asked to protect by means of the law. In other words, Congress's duty, according to the Pope, is to legislate laws, to write laws, to enact laws, and then, of course, enforce laws that will make us reflect the image and likeness of God in every human face. So it's the job of Congress, according to the Pope, to write and enforce these laws. In fact, it sounds like the Pope is actually saying that it's Congress's job to make God reflect in all the people of the world, not just the USA, the image of God. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe all of you understand the ramifications of the statement, but I'm not really wanting to focus on those ramifications right now. Instead, I would like to go down another path, and with your permission, come back to this later. Is that okay? And the reason why I want to go down another path is because I've been talking to many Adventists, many Adventists who grew up in the church in the 70s and 80s. And I'm appalled by their testimony. I'm appalled by what I hear them tell me on a regular basis. They constantly tell me that when they were in the church in the 70s and the 80s growing up in the church, and maybe times in the past, I, I'm not sure. This is just generations I've been talking to lately. And, and, and maybe some in the 90s, but I, I'm not sure. I wasn't, I wasn't an Adventist growing up. I, I didn't have that same atmosphere and environment in my life. I didn't have that same testimony, but I'm appalled by what I hear because they repeatedly tell me over and over and over the emphasis in the church, the message in the church was that you must keep the law of God. And if failure to keep the law of God means that you will lose out on heaven and you will go to hell. In other words, do what God says or go to hell. So, I, I want to dwell on the thought that the law, legislative laws, can help us or can, can make us reflect the image of Christ in our own selves. Let's look at that thought. But before we do, let's analyze this from a biblical, a biblical perspective and see what we find. First of all, is there a law that reflects God? Is there a law that reflects the character of God? Yes or no? Absolutely yes, right? We can look at it really quick. In the Bible, in John 4, 24, it describes God as being spiritual. In Romans 7, 14, it describes the law as being spiritual. In 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And in Matthew 23, 37 through 40, the law is love. In John 14, 6, we see that God is truth. And in Psalms 119, 142, we see that the law is truth. And I could go on. It describes righteousness and holy and perfect and stands forever and good and just and pure and unchangeable. All the attributes ascribed to God in the Bible, the same are ascribed to, guess what? The law. And why is the Bible making the purpose? Why is the meaning of ascribing the same attributes to each of them? Because the law is the transcript of God's character. The law perfectly reflects the image of God. The law perfectly reflects the purpose of God. The law perfectly reflects who God is, if you will. So, secondly, as Christians under God's grace, do we still need to keep the law of God? The answer? Absolutely. James 1, 22 through 25 teach us in, in, unequivocally, we need to be doers of the word and not just hearers. And then in Matthew 7, 21 through 24, we must do God's will to be in heaven, according to Jesus. It says, Lord, Lord, have we not done many great things? And he says, those who do my will are my children. You understand it's Matthew 7, 20, 21 through 24. You can look that up later. All right. So moving on. The third thing we need to look at before we get into the, the, the thrust of the message, is there a law that can make us reflect God? So we need not look any further than Jesus, the Jews for this answer. The Jews loved laws. 
They were given over 600 in the Torah, and when they decided that wasn't enough, they made a myriad more man-made laws to go with those that they considered equally binding. However, even though they seemed to love the law so much, they never actually were able to keep it, as Jesus points out all through the scriptures. So what happened to the Jews? Even though they had all of these laws, and even though they loved the law of God, what happened to the Jews that prevented them from keeping the law? Turn with me to Exodus 34. Turn with me to Exodus 34. In Exodus 34, we get a description of an event that took place with Moses. Exodus 34, Moses is told to go up on this mountain, and the Israelites are told to consecrate themselves. He's on this mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and when he comes down, the Bible describes him in a precarious situation, a precarious situation that the Jews were uncomfortable with. So what happened? What is the problem with the Jews in Exodus 34? As we read all about this, we read all about that throughout the Bible, but boy, did, did they know the law, the Jews knew the law, and were sure fast to accuse Jesus of not keeping it every chance they got. And we see this playing out in Exodus 34, the reason behind their fall. Exodus 34, I want to look at 27 through 33. Exodus 34, 27 through 33. Verse 27, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, you, you, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon, upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses would not, or wished not, that or knew not, sorry, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come to him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. So Moses goes up on this mountain. He spends 40 days and 40 nights communing with God. He gets this law that, 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 that describes, that, 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 uh, that uh, uh, summarizes the covenant that the Israelites have made with God. And he comes down and his face is aglow. And because his face is aglow, the Israelites are afraid to speak with him. And so they ask Moses to cover his face with a veil because they can't stand to be in his presence at that time. Can you imagine not wanting to be in the presence of a godly man? Can you imagine somebody who's so close to God it scares you. Now be careful before you answer that question. Because most of us would fall in the camp of the Israelites. When we've been around someone who is very godly. And they act just like God. And when we're around them, we start getting uncomfortable. Because our actions are in harmony with theirs. And sometimes when we're around that kind of person, sometimes when we're around those who are like Jesus, we find ourselves in uncomfortable situations because we're not following what we know that we should follow. The Israelites find themselves in this situation, leading Paul to summate and Timothy to write in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I really want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Because I think this is where we really understand what's taking place in this chapter. What was scaring the Israelites? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 17. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 17. Paul is going to tell us the problem that the Israelites had. Paul is going to tell us what this situation, this fear of this moment in Exodus 34 led to. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Excuse me. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth the Spirit, but the Spirit giveth life. 
But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory to be done away. So what is Paul talking about in this verse? What passage is he referring to? He's referring to Exodus 34. They couldn't stand to look on Moses' face because he had been so close to Jesus. He had been so close to God that it actually frightened them. And instead of wanting to behold Jesus and wanting to be close to God, they wanted to make another type of covenant. What was that covenant? In Exodus 19 and in Exodus 24, 3 through 8, you can read all about this. You can read that God had given them a list of rules and laws that they were to follow. And as God is saying this, the Israelites are scared of God in that context, in that passage as well. And they fire back, all that you say to do, we will keep. And that's the old covenant. The old covenant is the Israelites made a deal with God that everything God asked them to do, they would keep. Now, I just want to pause for a second. Is that covenant wrong? Hmm? Is it wrong? It's absolutely not wrong. Did God ask them to keep those laws? Did they say they would do it? That's a good covenant. Amen? The problem is, though, is that they didn't want to have the relationship with the God of the covenant. They fell in love with the law that they were to follow instead of the God of the law that was asking them to follow the law. You understand what I'm saying? Now, be very careful in verse 7. It says, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, what is it referring to the ministration of death? Because it almost sounds like Paul is saying we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. And many Christians have used this verse to say, see, it's been done away with. Paul himself says it's a ministration of death. So what is Paul referring to in this phrase, in this verse? He's referring to the method of the old covenant. He's referring to what the Israelites interpreted that as and tried to keep the law in and of themselves and tried to keep the letter of the law, which led to what? Which led to death. Indeed, it even led to the death of Jesus Christ. And Paul says that ministration of death did have some glory. He said there was some good in that. Think of it this way. If you were at night and you couldn't see anything around you and you lit a candle can you see? Does it do some good? Absolutely, it does some good. You can see. I could tell you many stories. Anytime I walk from my couch to my bedroom at night and I turn off all the lights, I turn my phone on just so I have a little bit of light so I can see. But when the sun comes up, does that candle do anything? Does nothing, right? So if you're in a darkened world, if you're surrounded by pagans, if you're surrounded by idolatry worshipers and all those who have nothing to do with God, does the law help in that case? Yes, like a candle shining in the dark. But when Jesus comes across, when the righteousness, the true righteousness of God comes out, does the law do anything? No, it has nothing to do with it. It doesn't do anything for us. Continuing on. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have, have such hope... We use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses was put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away from the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon what? Upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In other words, even to this day, says Paul, when the law of Moses is read, that same veil that was covering the face of Jesus, the face of Moses, I'm sorry, because it was reflecting Jesus, is a veil that covers their heart when it comes to Jesus. Because instead of wanting the God of the law, 
They want the law. They want to do it themselves. They want to perform their acts. They want to perform their tasks. They want to do it by themselves. They want to do it by works. Paul tells us it's the spirit that gives life. The law just condemns us. It actually leads to death by itself because it only condemns and judges. There is no power in the law by itself to help you keep it. And when the Jewish nation rejected Jesus, both as reflected in Moses' face and then later when Jesus actually came and walked the earth, they rejected the only power to help them keep their beloved law. And since there was no power to regenerate their hearts, the law only hardened them. They became legalists and used the very lawgiver's law to condemn the lawgiver himself as unjust as it was. When you follow the spirit of the letter of the law, I'm sorry, when you follow the letter of the law, it becomes heartless. It becomes callous. There's no compassion in it. It's just a letter. Follow me or perish. Break me and perish. When speaking on this topic, there was no excuse for the blindness of Israel in regard to the work of the regeneration. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah had written, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our unrighteousnesses are as filthy rags. David had prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. And through Ezekiel, the promise had been given, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. In other words, there was plenty in the Old Testament for the Jews to pull from to understand that the regeneration of the heart came through the Holy Spirit that it was an impossibility for them to keep the law. And oh, sure, there was some glory attached to it, just as you guys know probably from your life and from your history and your actions, that you can indeed keep the letter of the law, at least to some degree, for some time before you fall and come up short. And you get yourself a little high, a spiritual high, if you will, as you're keeping it, and you start feeling good about yourself, and then all of a sudden you start condemning others who aren't living up to your standard but then if you're like paul you meet jesus and the veil of your heart is removed and you realize that you're just as much a sinner as those you're condemning that you truly haven't kept any law of god just as facade that you've made up. But it also occurred to me that there's another problem going on in our world today. It occurred to me that there's so many Christians today, in fact, the vast majority of them, make the same mistake as did the Jewish nation when they asked Moses to mask the glory of God on his face. Except... They go from the opposite direction. Instead of asking to be veiled from God, they just want to put a veil over the law of God. The Jewish nation rejected Jesus because they liked their interpretation of the law. They wanted to form God's image into the image of their law. In other words, they did not want to be changed by God they wanted to change God. They wanted to make God fashioned like a man instead of let God fashion man like him. Just as it is with too many Christians today, those who don't keep the law of God want to form God in their image instead of letting God change them into his image. They want to do away with the law because they either don't want to be changed or have given up on God's power to change them. And in doing so, they make the same mistake as did the Jews, except instead of rejecting the lawgiver and ultimately missing the point of the law, they reject the law and ultimately 
they reject the lawgiver. Because when you reject the law, you're actually rejecting the God of the law. Because the law is the transcript of God's character. Listen to this from Great Controversy, page 22. The great sin of the Jews was the rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world would be the rejection of the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and earth. You see, the reason why in the book of Acts, when we read through these great events and these depictions of all these miracles and all these wondrous works that the apostles did in the book of Acts, they're always preaching about Jesus Christ. And why are they preaching about Jesus Christ so much? Because the Jews had rejected that truth. They didn't have a problem with the law. Every Jew was keeping the law. In fact, they had made new laws to keep. The Jews didn't have a problem with the law of God. If you were trying to talk to a Jew, you would never have to even do a Bible study on the law because they would know it better than you would. But the apostles understood their problem was they were rejecting Jesus Christ himself. That was the truth that was missing in their time. And now the truth that's missing in our time is not the truth of Jesus Christ because every Christian accepts Jesus. The truth missing in our time is the what? Is the law of God, is the standard of God because many have done away with the standard because they couldn't meet it. Many have done away with the standard because it doesn't conform to their picture of how they want to live. And that's the great truth that's been neglected for our time. When we, when we do not surrender our all to God, we are actually telling God we do not want to reflect him in that area. That we like our reflection better. And you might be thinking right now, yes, we know that and believe that. But how do you do that? Because that which I want to do I don't do. And that which I do not want to do, that I do. I had this coworker a long time ago, and she became a Christian. And we started talking back and forth. She went to some uh, non denominational church. And we started talking back and forth quite a bit. In fact, it got to the point where she invited me over to her house to, to meet with her and her husband and study the Bible with them. And I was studying the Bible with them, and we went over the Sabbath. And we got done talking about the Sabbath, and we were going to come back one more day to finish up the Bible study, to go over another aspect of the Sabbath. And she told me that I didn't need to come over anymore. And I asked why, and she said, because I don't want to be distracted. I said, what are you distracted from? She says, I don't want to be distracted from Jesus. She had painted this picture in her mind that if you focus on the law of God, it distracts you from Jesus. And while that is true, if you solely focus on the law of God, it distracts you from Jesus. But if you focus on Jesus, he brings you into harmony with the, with the law of God. And so you can't do away with the law because if you do, you're doing away with part of God. You understand what I'm saying? In her mind, she had fixed the point that it was a distraction, and she didn't need it. So I asked the question, what was John the Baptist's message right before Jesus came? What was the message of John the Baptist? It was a twofold message. It had two parts to it. Repent and behold. Repent. And behold, the message of John the Baptist, repent and behold. Don't make the mistake of our ancestors before us. Drop the veil. Don't veil the law. It is, to, it, it is pure and holy. And definitely don't veil the presence of Jesus because he is the answer to be pure and holy. Repent, acknowledge you have violated God's law, and in doing so, you are a sinner. Repent, ask for his help to turn away. And then behold the great lawgiver who is your Savior. You say, but pastor, my promises are like ropes of sand. 
I've heard this message. I've been sitting in this church for a long time. And yes, there's been growth. But when it comes to keeping the law, I find myself falling short constantly. What you need to understand is the power of the will. While you can't choose to obey the law, you can choose to serve Jesus Christ. You can never choose to serve the law because it will always lead you to failure. But you can always choose to serve Jesus Christ and he'll give you the victory. Your situation is not helpless and you're not hopeless. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away, Hosea 14, 4. And I will put my spirit in you and cause you to wake and walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments, Ezekiel 36, 27, as our scripture reader said. Thousands of years ago, God made the moon to reflect the sun, and today God can make you reflect the sun. Just as when the sun comes out in the morning and the stars quit shining, when the sun comes out in your life, you quit sinning. You see, Pope Francis, there's no law made that can cause you to reflect the image of God. <laughs> Congress can't make a law. You can't make one. Not even God tried to make a law for us to reflect his image. But just as Moses went up on a mountain, when we spend time with Jesus, we will reflect God's image because he will bring us into his law. In verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul says, spend time with Jesus. Behold Jesus. When your face is aglow, don't veil it. Keep looking. Keep looking more and more and focus more and more on Jesus. Because in doing so, you'll find victory. In doing so, you'll keep his law. In doing so, you'll reflect his image, which is his law. You know, I've, I've had this rash now for over three weeks. I went to the doctor for the third time. He's convinced it's a chlorine rash. But I have a problem and the problem is, the first time I went to the doctor, he gave me steroids, and I took them. And the rash went away. And then as soon as the treatment stopped, it came back. The second time I went to the doctor, he gave me more steroids. And I took them, and the rash went away. But as soon as the treatment stopped, the rash came back. The third time, I went to a different doctor, and he gave me more steroid treatments. But he said, Jay, you need to quit treating the symptoms. I need to start treating the cause. Amen. He says, you need these steroids or else you're not going to be able to sleep. You're going to itch all the time. You're going to be miserable. Take the steroids. But start using lotions and drinking lots of water. And use soaps that clean the chlorine off the skin. Get rid of the chemical, and then the rash will go away. When we try to keep the law without Jesus, we're treating symptoms of sin. And yes, it can be effective for a short period of time, but inevitably we are going to fail and fall short. But when we start looking to the person who can treat the cause, when we start looking to the person that can change us from the inside out, when we're filled with the Spirit of God and we start reflecting His image, the sin falls away and we're able to be like God. 
We can never change the standard. We can never lower standard. We can never remove the standard. And we can never make the mistake of trying to make God into our image. Instead, we must go to God, tell him our true condition, humble ourselves before him. God, I'm the one you're talking to. I'm the sinner. I need you. And I'm going to keep looking to you. And I'm going to wrestle with you like Jacob did. Until I'm like you. And if you do that, your sin is going to go away. I want to do that. Amen. Father, help us to behold you. Give us fresh eyes to see you, Lord. Father, the law without you is meaningless. It's pointless. It leads to death. It's, it leads to guilt. It shrinks us. It stunts growth, Lord. It's abusive and manipulative. But Lord, with you, through your power, through the spirit that you promise us, the law is beautiful because it makes us like you, Lord. But only, I'm sorry, let me change that. The law tells us how to be like you. The law tells us what to pray for. The law tells us what to look for. And then you make us like you. Father, help us to focus on you so that we can be changed into your image. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 108. 108, Amazing Grace. Carlos, good chance for you to come up. There's no video today and I can't sing, so I'm sure they'd much rather hear you. Number 108, Amazing Grace. Shall we stand, please?
thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not to be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, walking, if I wake me nor sleeping, thy presence, my life. 